Hello there, welcome back to my channel. As you can tell by the title, we're off on a trip to Scarborough Sea Life Centre, also known as the Sea Life Aquarium. And I thought I'd bring you along and with my family and we can have fun together today. I have to freely admit that I'm very, very drawn to water, as many people are. Um, if you read my books, uh, the Crystal Water series, obviously water, I'm just very drawn to it. And every book, um, I like to put mermaids in them. So I'm absolutely fascinated by anything under the water, the deep sea. It just is mesmerising to me. In my writing, I love to look for really descriptive words within um, each scene. And when I write about water, I think of gushing and humming and lapping, murmuring, um, things like uh, dreaming and mysterious, flowing. It's all like adds to the mystery of the, uh, the deep ocean and to me, it's such a fascinating place to be. I thought it would be a bit fun if I just read out some some paragraphs from my book. The crystal this is from the crystal waters it began in Europe and of course it's all around the mermaid scene. The girls looked over to their mer friends who were patiently waiting. They smiled and each took one of the girls' hands. Emma and Grace also held hands as they slowly put their heads under the water. They were then quickly whisked away by the mer girls. Water filled Emma's lungs and it felt cold at first, but it warmed quickly and felt quite refreshing, as if her airways were having a good cleanse. Bubbles flew past her and tickled her face. She looked around her and could see everything so clearly. Even over in the distance she could see the glistening underwater city and it was rapidly approaching as the mer girls guided them in. I'm Nyads, by the way, said the mer girl that was holding Emma's hand. Hi, replied Emma then gasped and chuckled as she then realised she could now talk underwater. And I'm Nereids, said the mer girl, holding em Grace's hand. Grace nodded nervously in response. When Nereids looked forward in the direction they were going, Grace took a good look at her for the first time. Her long silver hair had turned a radiant green in the turquoise water and it billowed out behind them. Her flawless skin that once shimmered above water now looked a brilliant white and the scales that covered her chest and down and around her tail were opalescent. Grace looked over to Nayad's and she was almost identical apart from Nayad's hair was the colour of glistening black charcoal. Soon they were gliding gently down to the huge city entrance. Two guards floated motionless on top of each turret that framed the magnificent green iron gates. They paused and watched the gates slowly creak open. Emma looked up at the guards and one of them glanced down at her, gave her a cheeky wink before looking forward again into his military stare. Through the gates they floated Stone houses on either side of the pathway framed the scene. These houses weren't square like the usual ones Emma were used to living in, but round. They looked like great piles of snow with holes in for windows and doors. As she looked closer, she saw mer people inside going about their daily routines. However, they stopped and waved when they spotted the girls. They passed by mound upon mound of these strange looking houses. Some were bigger than others and looked like a place of gathering. 
food markets, prayer houses and play areas for children and schools. The pathway now sloped upwards and Emma and Grace looked up to a huge palace carved into the rock face itself. Like Gornia Palace she had, had seen days before, its enormity was quite overwhelming. But whereas the Gornia Palace was dark and foreboding, this palace had an air of radiance and felt welcoming. You can check out this book if you want, um, Crystal Waters, It Began in Europe by Diana Rozevskis, which is me, of course. Um, from Amazon, it's on Kindle, um, from my Etsy store where I sign the books. All the links are, are in the description below. And it's also on Audible, which is read out by Mel Hayward, now known as Mel Gregg, because she got married. And she reads it out much better than I can. So check, go and check them out if you want. The next book in the series is called Crystal Waters and On to North America. And I thought I'd read a little bit about the mermaids in this one as well. The children didn't waste any more time and jumped into the water, raring to go. One by one, with Emma going first, they were led down under, under the water. Emma's mermaid was called Pame, a beautiful young mermaid with red hair with golden shells entwined, which rippled in the water like fire on a breeze. Grace was right behind her, being led by Etchemin, the only merboy in the group, his large hand carefully wrapped around Grace's as they skimmed through the water. His shoulders were broad and his muscular physique made him a strong swimmer, so they were soon swimming alongside Emma and Pame. Then with another flick of his large emerald green, green tail, he took the lead. Show off! shouted Pame. The boys were soon following, Robert with mer a mergirl called Tallulah with jet black hair tied into a very long plait and Tom with a mergirl called Pavati, her sandy coloured hair streaming out behind her as, as they glided peacefully along. They passed by a school of sunfish their stunning orangey-green speckled bodies and black dorsal fins darted off into the shallows. The children with their mer partners, however, were swimming deeper. Soon they could see the lake bed below them, its murky bottom hiding all sorts of wildlife amongst the tall grasses and lake weeds. A green fluorescent glow shone down from the water's surface giving the whole place a mystical ambience. On they swam through the underwater gorges, through aquatic dark caves and finally came out to a valley and before them lay a beautiful city of Anawan. Great towers of chiselled rock spiralled up towards the water's surface. These surrounded a lower wider building that at first glance looked like an enormous conch shell. Spanned out at its feet were the city houses themselves, all shaped and, and sizes, but all carved out of the same light grey rock and covered in the same green algae as, as the towers were. As they swam closer, they could see walkways and parks with spiral steps leading to larger buildings. Emma and Grace, Robert and Tom stopped for a moment to admire the view before they all went on through the gates. Two large green structures overlooked a gigantic portcullis and in the very top were the mermen who guarded the city. They saw them all approaching and winced up the gate to let them in. My next book in the Crystal Waters series is uh, Crystal Waters Next Stop to Antarctica 
I thought I'd read a little bit from that as well. As Karina had predicted, they were to visit the Mavernians next. The children were delighted to find out these were the Mer people who lived in the underwater city under Ross Island. The group were led by Mark down to an underground where they kept the soaps. These bubble-like vessels were large enough to hold at least 20 people, submerging them into the icy depths and taking them to the cities. The subs were technically adapted to enter both cities. In the city of Atlantis, the craft pushes through the domed force field from water to air and then gently glides down to the Atlantean surface. Whereas when entering the Mervernian city, also known as the great city of Mervyn, it glides through the seabed's steep tunnels, which on first sight looks like the bottom of an iceberg and rises up to a surface pool in the centre of the city. There, the Mavernians were hoisted up from the water to lift to ground level and their fins would transform into legs. The group had never seen anything like this before. The Mer people they had encountered in the past had stayed as Mer people and hadn't been able to transform. These were truly a more advanced species indeed. The group climbed out of their sub and walked up the metal stairs which had been lowered to them. They were greeted by two Mervernian girls. It was then that Emma and Grace noticed something else that was different about these Mer people. Their skin that had been a fluorescent green in the water had now changed to a soft blue. Then before their eyes it changed again into a bright yellow. The group, mesmerised by the Mer people's forever changing skin colour, hardly heard what the girls had just said. Uh, pardon, what did you say, dear? asked Gran. She too was, ta was quite taken aback. I said, would you like to follow us? Queen Cheryl is expecting you, said the blonde-haired girl, whose skin had just turned a deep purple shade. Seabird looked pleased with this and gave a little bark. As they followed the girls, the blonde girl chatted to her red-haired friend. Soon they came to a hall where, with such beauty, it took their breath away. Everywhere, from the ceiling, walls and floor, including all the furniture in the room, was covered in a different coloured crystal. It was as if they had just walked into a pirate's treasure trove. Queen Cheryl, who had come over to greet them, laughed at their expressions. It was the second time since they had arrived that they had all been lost for words. Impressive, is it not? She smiled. Of course, we Minervians, who see it every day, are quite used to it by now. I guess now and again I take a step back and think how blessed we are to live in such a beautiful city. Bill came forward and bowed to the Queen, and we are truly blessed that you can receive us today, he said. I see you have met my two daughters, Princess Jenny, said Queen Cheryl, indicating to the blonde girl, and Pr Princess Averta. She now pointed to the red-haired girl who lowered her head in a standing bow. The group, now feeling quite abashed by their, by their lack of manners when first meeting the two princesses, greeted them heartily. Do not worry, my friends. You are not the first to have been overwhelmed by our city and the beauty it contains. We do not stand on ceremony. It is, as you will be no doubt glad to hear, very relaxed here. Now come, the feast awaits and I'm sure you will all be famished. Next, I thought I'd read from uh, the fourth book in the Crystal Water series, Crystal Waters Onward Bound to Africa. Herman was beginning to feel thoroughly downhearted. I really do appreciate the tour, he said, but we must try and find my wife. I know she must be here somewhere. He looked around across the grand foyer as if he half expected Olga to come running towards him at any moment. Yes, yes, of course, my friends. 
But where shall we start to look? Your case is extremely rare, and I don't think we have ever dealt with such matters before, said Jazz. Before Herman could answer with, I haven't got a clue, Naz let out an excited squeak. What about the Mertanias? said Naz. Yes, good thinking. That would be a great place to start. They've been here far longer than we have, said Jazz. But how will we take them there? They can only breathe air. Naz shook her head at her sister with disbelief. Jazz, what are we? Jazz looked at Naz as if this was a trick question. African breeze bucklers, she said slowly. And what elements do we control, said Naz knowingly. Jazz cottoned on quickly. The air, she exclaimed. We control all the elements of the air. She then frowned and looked at the group. But how do we give it to them? Like this, she said and she quickly hopped onto Herman's back and immediately her hand cupped into what looked like a transparent oxygen mask. She then placed it gently over Herman's nose and mouth. Yes, that'll work, cried Jazz. We just need a few more of us for the, other, for the others. Oh, and we can get some of those goggles from the lab, she said excitedly. So, before the group knew it, more breeze bucklers had joined them and they were all assembled down in one of the basement chambers. Jazz had collected nine pair of goggles and was struggling on, struggling to put a pair on poor Seba, who didn't like them at all. Emma bent over him and whispered a few words in his ear. He replied back with one short bark. Try again now, said Emma. He's okay. Jazz lifted up the goggles and fastened them at the back of his head with no trouble at all. Wow, you really have a way with dogs, don't you? It's as if you, he really understood you, said Jazz. Herman noticed Emma surreptitiously give Seba a wink before she too put on her goggles. They were then taken over to a large round pool and with each member of the group attached to a breeze buckler on their backs, they all leapt into the pool. Hi, I'm Tadita, said one of the breeze bucklers as she jumped on Emma's back. Wow, you're lighter than a feather, said Emma. I'm Emma, by the way, and with that, she leapt into the water. Herman, who had a buckler on his back called Adisa, was already in the water and he could hardly feel him at all. They dove under the under and Adisa kicked out his legs behind them and they were propelled forward in a stream of bubbles. Down they swam, following the other silhouetted figures of his family until the, the light began to brighten and soon he could see a beautiful underwater city just below him. Herman knew he should be freezing in the water yeah. on t Titania but he felt quite warm. They really are clever beings, these globe geysers, he thought. Before they knew it, they had been surrounded by Mertanians, who were so white they shone. The only colour in the, their ghost-like appearance were their eyes, which were huge and the deepest colour of blue Herman had ever seen. The Mer people soon recognised the breeze bucklers and the group were escorted into their city. They were taken to the Great Hall and were soon greeted by the Mertanian leaders, Padrag and his wife Gala. And with the video coming to an end, unfortunately I can't read any more from the Crystal Waters book series. I've just finished book four, but there's also book five, book six and book seven and I show you um, in each one there is mermaids uh, so go and check them out I'm going to leave all the links down below and so the uh, next book which is book five crystal waters to Australasia and beyond and then book six is um, crystal waters and adventure in Asia
and the last book, book seven, is Crystal Waters' last trip to South America. And so with the video coming to a close, I just wanted to thank you for watching and I hope you enjoyed the readings as we went through the aquarium. I just thought it would add a little bit of interest to it. And so I'll leave you with the, the rest of the video and I will see you soon. Bye.